chapter 15, Monsters. I guess it is Saturday morning now. The sun is just lighting up the sky out the window. I hear cow noises, whatever the technical term is for that, but I don't see the responsible parties. It's still relatively dark. I'm standing at the window in my, be in my new bedroom. After my last conversation with Dr. Sutton, I found my parents lying in separate beds in the room across the hall. Neither one seemed living, but they weren't dead either. I stood in the room through several waves of pain before getting sick of the emotional, not roller coaster. What's the carnival ride that lifts you up real high in a chair and then just drops you? An emotional one of those. There's nothing I can do for them except wait for them to regain consciousness and then coach them through the confusion. How am I going to do that? I thought about going to see Rachel right after leaving my parents. I decided to take some time alone to contemplate things. I must have fallen asleep after lying down to think. I don't really know. My concept of time is all out of whack. I think I should go find Rachel and talk to her about everything. Maybe she can give me a heads up on her mom's plans if she knows any more about them than I do. If she does know more about, if she does know more, it might be because she knew all along. In which case, I don't want to know. I don't want to talk to her. Someone is knocking at the door. The door opens before I can respond to the knock. It's Rachel. Hey, I was just thinking about going to find you. I'd like to talk to you if that's okay with you. I say, yes, that's a, pfft. yes, that's why I came up here. But let's go for a walk outside, okay? She says. Rachel seems different, but I don't know if that's because everything seems different to me or if she's changed as well. She isn't expressing any obvious emotion right now. She's dressed simply, as usual, with her hair up. I don't know if I'm supposed to leave the house, according to your mom's rules in my observation phase. I say, alone. You aren't allowed to leave alone. But really, that just means don't be seen in public by anyone who knows you and believes you were killed in a car crash a few days ago. The public might not respond well to seeing you alive when you were supposed to be dead. You can walk around the ranch with me. No one will see us. This is the kind of statement that should scare a person when it is a zombie saying it to them. But that's not how I responded when presented with similar invitations before, and now I'm a zombie myself. More importantly, Rachel mentioned the car crash story, so she knows about that part. But did she know about it before we last spoke? That's what I need to find out. All right, let's go, I say. Neither one of us speaks as we descend the two flights of stairs and make our way out the front door. Not until we are outside and beyond hearing range from the house. Even then, we walk in silence for a short while. I try to get the conversation going with a little humor. That's how Rachel and I used to talk. Used to. All of three days ago. Rachel, when you came up to the room to get me, I told you I had been planning to find you so we could talk. You said that's why you were there. Did you mean you were there to talk, or were you there because you knew I was planning to find you? What? Rachel asks with confusion apparent in her voice. I mean, we don't have some kind of zombie mind link or something, do we? You weren't reading my mind because we were both zombies. You just meant that you wanted to talk to me, not that you knew that I was thinking, knew what I was thinking. I'm trying to be humorous. Obviously, we wouldn't have a mind link. It sounds like something Hollywood might try. However, I'm not entirely sure something like that might be possible. Might not be possible. I'm not entirely sure something like that might not be possible. After all, I am a zombie. I really can't stress that enough. Talk about paradigm shifts. Oh yeah, we don't have any kind of mind link. Your thoughts are safe from me or anyone else. We we're just reanimated corpses, not telepathic zombies. Rachel laughs a little, which is really all that I was going for. Of course, it's good to know she can't read my mind. Not that I'm so concerned about her, but until I figure out Dr. Sutton better, I don't want her to know I'm not actually as accepting as I'm pretending to be right now. Good. I think that would be difficult to deal with. I say, feigning significant relief by wiping my forehead. Wiping my forearm across my forehead. Why? You have a lot of thoughts that you don't want anyone to know about? Her eyes are squinty and suspicious. This is more like how we used to talk. Used to. Three days ago, yes. Nothing specific. It's just a matter of individual liberty, that's all. My life was taken from me. I'd like to at least keep my mind for myself. Honest, but perhaps not the most sensitive thing to say to someone before attempting to fish incriminating information from her. Rachel stops walking and turns away from me. I shouldn't have said that. I hope I don't lose her over it. I decide to wait for her this time. Let her take whatever time she needs to craft her words. Eric, I'm sorry my mom and dad did this to you. I didn't know, honestly. Maybe I suspected it, but I really didn't think it would happen. And then your parents, too. I don't like it. I guess she didn't need much time to mount, or, mount the response after all. And it sounds like my lament wasn't out of line as I thought. Wasn't as out of line as I thought. She agrees with me. Or she's pretending to. I'll remain cautious. She turns to look at me and continues. I wanted you to come out here to talk with me because I need your help. I'm afraid of what mom is going to do next. She's been lying to me, Eric, for nearly three years. Everything I told you the other day, what she had been telling me for all this time, was just a cover. All that stuff about Frank, it was all a lie. Mom explained it after I found your parents. I didn't know they came here Wednesday. I didn't know they came here Wednesday night because I was hiding in my room trying to make sense of what my parents had done to you. I was out for a walk when they came by on Thursday. 
<clears throat> it wasn't until after I spoke with you yesterday morning when you were really awake that I knew they were here. I met Frank in the hallway. I hadn't seen him since I was with you out on the highway. I still thought he was up to something and we were going to be leaving just as soon as he transitioned. But it was all lies. I can't believe I was so stupid to believe it all. Rachel looks like she might cry, but she doesn't. I really want to believe what she is telling me. It absolves her of any guilt in my murder, but I just don't know yet. It's not stupid to believe your parents, especially in such a strange situation as you've had. I don't think anyone would blame you for believing your mom. That doesn't excuse her, but you probably shouldn't beat yourself up over it. I try to be encouraging and comforting. <laughs> Rachel's demeanor doesn't change. She says, yeah, I guess. It's just so crazy. I thought Frank was off declaring war on humanity, but he was just out. I don't know where. Well, right under my nose, my mom was the one waging that war. When I saw Frank, I called for my dad. We were on the second floor, and he was just in, in his room, so he was there quickly. When he didn't freak out at the sight of Frank, I got really scared. I had just left you with a feeling of suspicion about my parents' reasoning for doing this to you. I had just left you with a feeling of suspicion about my parents' reasoning for doing this to you. I asked what was going on, and Frank said, I guess the jig is up, Tom. He actually said that the jig was up. It'd be funny if it wasn't so serious. I interrupt. No, it's still pretty funny picturing Frank saying that. Did he look serious when he said it? Yeah, kind of. I mean, I think he was being sincere. Rachel and I both laugh for real, but only briefly. It's still good to laugh with her, however short. She returns to her story. Upon hearing the jig was up, Dad said, I think we should talk with your mother. So they took me downstairs and we found Mom. She explained everything to me, about her secret work these last few years, about your parents, about Frank. She apologized for lying, but said it was necessary to keep me safe. She told me about you. She said from the moment she met you, she considered you as the perfect trial. She liked that you were net, that she liked that you were new to town first, but then she thought that our friendship was a nice touch. You and me, I mean. She said she just generally liked you. That's when she came up with the story about Frank in hopes of motivating me to bring you into my confidence and, well, doing exactly what I did. Talk about making a good first impression, I say. Rachel laughs again, but this time it's the kind of laugh usually reserved for police and morticians. She shakes her head and starts walking again, further out toward the pastures. I don't start moving until she has a 10-yard lead, or thereabouts. I start out after her and catch up after she stops at the fence around the pasture area. She's leaning on the upper rail of the wooden fence, so I lean too. Rachel starts talking again. It's been a few months, apparently, since Mom and Frank and Mark figured out whatever it was they figured out to make this virus strain they used on you. Mom became very excitable when talking about it. I kept it all secret. I didn't even know Mom was working on anything scientific. I never saw her in the lab. I thought it was just Frank and Mark tinkering and keeping themselves occupied. Rachel stops and turns towards me. With a straight face, she says, they want to release the virus. They think this is the next step in human evolution. The next step in human evolution is to kill all humans? I ask, turning my body to face her. I don't understand it either, but that's what they are planning. As scientists, they need to do their trials and make sure the virus is going to do what they hope it will do in humans. So now they have their test cases. You and your parents. Oh, it's terrible what they've done. I don't know how they think they pulled off their cover story. Won't the police be suspicious that there aren't any bodies? Not to be morbid, but Rachel lets me finish the thought on my own. Your mom told me they had a little help from some friends with some form of authority. I suppose they were more in allegiance with the agency than you had told me, I say. She thinks about this for a moment. That sounds plausible. I didn't tell you before, but my dad used to work for the agency. When I told you he used to have an exciting job and that he seemed depressed living out his life here on the ranch, the exciting job was working for the agency. I thought he lost that job when we came here, but maybe he never really left it. He doesn't leave home for extended periods of time like he did before we transitioned, but that doesn't mean he's not working with them somehow. Look what my mom has been able to do without me knowing about it. My parents are murderous liars. We are still standing face to face, so I nod, consolingly. What can I say? It's true. I'm not going to dispute it, but all the same, I feel for her. Once again, my timing may be poor, but it's time to challenge her story and find out if she's being sincere with me. If her story is true, she and I are on the same team, and we are victims in her mother's war on humanity. If her story is not true, then she's doing her mother's work and trying to force me to be a team player. I want to believe Rachel is being honest with me, because let's face it, up until a few days ago, I thought I'd be asking her out on a proper date. Some of that mindset is still in my head, being processed intermittently by the virus. Like it or not, the virus, this body is crushing on Rachel still, but not if she is a knowing accomplice to my murder or the murder of my parents. Rachel, I appreciate you filling in all of these details for me. I hope you can forgive me for what I say next, but I have to say it either way. I've been assaulted, murdered, lied to, and orphaned in only three days' time by your parents and their family. You invited me to your house on, on Wednesday, and here we are on Saturday. Zombies on a cattle ranch in the middle of nowhere. My parents have also been killed. An elaborate hoax has been enacted to make it seem like that we were killed in a car accident 
Now, you are telling me that humankind is in danger of extinction through the introduction of a virus that a few mad scientists, zombies, think is the next stage in human evolution. This time, Rachel interrupts me. What's your point? My point? I have a point. I'm just building up momentum. Okay, sorry for interrupting. No problem. So all that stuff has happened and is happening, and I need to know one thing. Are you telling me the truth? I would honestly love nothing more than to believe what you're telling me and to take confidence in our friendship, but hopefully you can appreciate it. I'm having a tough time with this. How can I know you aren't lying to me now as another aspect of your mom's devious plans? Rachel looks hurt. I'm inclined to take this as my answer, but I want to hear what she has but I want to hear what she has to say. You can't know. I guess it's all there is to it. You either trust me or you don't. What made you believe me Tuesday night and not write me off as a loon? What made you talk to me Wednesday morning and then agree to spend time with me alone after I confessed to being a zombie? Why did you believe me then, but not now? She asks. That's not exactly what I was expecting her to say. I thought she'd defend herself a little more, but she raises some valid questions. I suppose I need to be completely open with her if I want the same in return. I believed you then because I didn't fully believe you, or I didn't fully appreciate what you were saying, that it was possible. I don't know why I didn't dismiss you as a loon. Possibly it was because I had a major crush developing. I don't know how to explain how or why that happens, but I know it can make a person dismiss reality in some ways. Maybe that's what it's, maybe that's what it was for me. But when you told me you were a zombie, it felt like you were telling the truth. I can't recall with enough clarity how it felt when we were talking on Tuesday and Wednesday. Obviously, now I know you were telling the truth about the zombie thing, and I really want to believe that you didn't know what was going, on, going to happen and that you've only found this all out yesterday. However, your mom has said a few things that make me suspicious that perhaps you have been on her side all along. Seeing your reaction to my words makes me pretty sure you are sincere, but there's that old saying, you know, turn me into a zombie once, shame on me. Enlist me in your evil plans to destroy humankind, shame on you. Something like that. Rachel doesn't laugh at my joke. I guess I didn't expect her to. It's wrapped in some pretty sharp barbs and dripping with jellyfish toxins. That's a painful thought. Well, Eric, it sounds like you've already made up your mind about me, and for some reason you are leaning more towards what you inferred from what my mom said than towards what I'm telling you straight. My mom, the one who did this to you, is the one you are trusting against our history, however short it has been, and your instinct when you see my reaction to your words. I don't know what I can do for you to prove my honesty. This isn't television, so I'm not going to just kiss you if that's what you're looking for. I smile and shake my head. This conversation can go both ways, you know, she continues. You spent more time with my mom in the last day than you have with me. I don't know what she's, I don't know what has changed in you through the transition. I don't know if you aren't the one being used to manipulate me, as you seem to believe is true of me. So I could demand a sign of trust from you, like you are demanding of me. Checkmate. I guess kissing you won't do the trick, I say, suddenly feeling the weight of my suspicion and accusation come crashing down on me like an avalanche. I think I've been unfair. I wanted to believe Rachel. She makes a good point. Why then did I give so much credibility to what her mom said? Because I wanted to know what her mom's plans to do. I, wanted, <laughs> I don't want to get played again, but I don't have anyone else to trust. If I choose to trust Rachel and she does, and she does rat me out, what difference does it really make? My parents and I are dead. I could run away and try to get to the CDC. But what about my, what about my parents? And then what about me? Will the CDC just lock me up the same way Dr. Sutton has? Will they cure my virus by killing me? What's left of me, that is. What's left of me, that is. I don't know how to, I don't know how to say that. Entertain. I don't know. Will they cure my virus by killing me? What's left of me, that is. Maybe that's it. Right. I've been looking at my feet, contemplating. So I look up at Rachel. She isn't looking at me, but soon meets my gaze. We don't speak, just look. I was so intent on getting her to prove her trustworthiness that I accused her of dishonesty and damaged what credibility she saw in me. Rachel takes control of the moment. I know you don't have any real reason to trust me. I understand your perspective on what has happened. Remember, we didn't ask for this to happen to us either. My mom and the others are trying to make the best of the situation. After three years, I think it's getting to them. I think Dad is starting to enjoy it. He seems more alive in the last few days now than he has, that he has some secret agent stuff to do again. I'm really worried about all of them. I think they're going to release the virus soon. As soon as they are confident it won't turn Cranston into a city of rotting corpses. They prefer living corpses. But not me. I don't like any of it. If my parents hadn't kept promising me a normal life all this time, I might have tried to end it myself. For myself, I mean. But I remained trusting and hopeful that I would be able to live as though I weren't a zombie. I realize now that it is impossible. All the needed secrecy at school made me an outsider. When I met you, I felt something. Something good. I wanted to see what would happen without the secrecy. I realized that I couldn't have healthy, normal relationships without the other person knowing about my virus. You took it well. I really didn't think you'd be so understanding and accepting. I don't have any reason now to be suspicious of you, but your accusation of me being accomplice to what has happened to you and your parents makes me defensive. And if you can think I'm working for my mom, then why can't I think you are doing the same? You are doing the same. You really should have been frightened when I told you about the virus, but you weren't, so that's odd. 
I don't know. It's been a rough week, she says, exasperated, and sits down in the dry grass with her back against the rails of the fence. I laugh a little and sit down next to her. We sit for a few minutes and say nothing. I don't know what she's thinking about, but I'm trying to figure out what I can say to restore our relationship and figure out what our next move should be. After a few minutes more, I think I've got it. You're absolutely right. About it being a rough week, she asks. About everything. Rachel, listen, I'm really sorry I was suspicious of you and for accusing you of being part of Dr. Sutton's crimes against humanity, literally. From what I can recall of our time together, I can see you've been sincere with me. I'm sure I, if I could recall everything a little more clearly, I'd realize that even more. I hope I haven't damaged your opinion of me so much that you can't trust me now. I don't want to use it as an excuse, but I was turned into a zombie this week. That should cut me some slack, right? Hmm. Okay, I'm going to trust you, Rachel. I trust you before, trusted you before, and I will trust you again. My primary concern now is to get my parents and go on our way. I don't know what that means, really, or how we'll fare as zombies. We'll probably end up in a hospital quarantine or something, and we'll die as they observe and study us and do whatever they can to cure the virus. I think that's what I want at this point. I don't want to be a zombie. But then there's you, I say. Rachel seems a little shocked, but I'm not sure at what. But you don't have you don't have to die again. Let me restart that sentence. But you don't have to die again. You can live like this. Don't you feel mostly the same as you did before? She asks. I do, but not completely the same. There's enough difference for me to wonder about what will happen in the future. Will something change in me after a few years that I'm the one looking to advance human evolution by introducing a fatal virus that reanimates dead bodies and makes them walk around like a puppet oblivious to the fact that they should be buried in a cemetery? I mean, eventually, whatever remnant of me that is left in the wiring of my brain is going to fade or something, and I won't be me anymore. <clears throat> I probably won't even realize it is happening. I don't want that. But what about your parents? Rachel asks. I'm going to explain this to them and see what they think, she follows up with. Then what about me? You said you want to get your parents and leave. Perhaps let's just, perhaps let yourselves all die again. But then there's me. So what about me, Eric? That is the question, I say, and look off into the distance. And you gotta wait till the next chapter. To find out. Monsters. Hmm. Okay. That was chapter fifteen. I don't remember. I don't remember that one at all. <laughs> Good stuff. All right. Next week. Turn it off to the song.